Hello everyone, welcome to Edu Made Easy. We offer a collection of free resources for IGCSC and checkpoint exams. For more, please visit www.edumadeeasy.com. Today we're going to be solving Chemistry 0620, paper 62 for the May-June 2023 series. Let's get started. Hot powder lead to oxide is reduced by methane, a flammable gas. The products are lead, steam, and carbon dioxide gas. Figure 1.1 shows the apparatus used to reduce lead to oxide using excess methane. So they're shown us with arrows where the methane goes and where the uh, powdered lead to oxide is inside this tube um, connected with these bungs. And then over here to this uh, like tube with eyes in a beaker. So name the uh, type uh, item of apparatus labeled A. So as I said before, that's going to be a beaker. Although it looks like fairly large, we still call it a beaker. Draw an arrow on figure 1.1 to show where the apparatus should be heated. So the um, tube over here should be heated directly on the powdered lead to oxide because it's being reduced. Sorry, we're reducing methane from the powdered lead to oxide. So just draw an arrow like that, just right. Um, pointing onto the powdered oxide, lead to oxide. Explain why powdered lead to oxide is used and not a large lump. So this is basically asking why increased surface area and not like, well, smaller surface area. This is because the larger surface area increases the what? The rate of reaction. Explain what happens at the point labeled B. So what's happening is the ice will cool the gas that's coming in from the um, the heating tube over here. And then it's going to condense, right? So the ice cools the gas and therefore condenses. That's why we have the ice in the beaker. So the hot gas comes from here. So the ice cools down this vapor and it turns into a liquid because it condenses. The waste gas contains methane. State why the waste gases should not be released into the laboratory. Read the first part very carefully. The fact that it is mentioned that it's a flammable gas. So if there is an open flame, that's definitely very, very dangerous because methane is being and there could be an incident. So no naked flames. Um, I mean, if you're doing this, you, there should be no flames anyway, except for your here. Um, but other than that, it shouldn't be raised in the laboratory. Question two says, a student investigates how the rate of the reaction between aqueous iron, three nitrate and aqueous thorium thiosulfate changes with temperature. So the student does five experiments using apparatus. So your school should have done this experiment like practic in a practical. Um, and I remember doing this. Um, we did use sodium thiosulfate because I think that's the only solution that works. But it's basically checking the concentrations and how quickly the arrow disappears, right? How the precipitate is formed. So I'm not going to read the experiment ones and twos. I'm going to pause the video and read it and I'll come back. And there's a bit above here too. So let's just read this. Okay, uh, so now we have to use the thermometer diagrams and stop clock diagrams to complete table 2.1. So this part is fairly easy. You just got to concentrate and read the diagrams properly. So for the time taken for the text to become visible. Sorry, not, uh, oh yeah. Okay, sorry. It's for the sodium thiosulfate to become, the solution to become visible and not to become a white precipitate. Sorry, I thought about it the other way. Anyway, so it's in seconds. So we cannot do like one minute, 50 seconds. We have to convert all of it into seconds. So if you read here, we have, let's see. Oh, this is minutes. So it's not completely two minutes. So it's one minute, what? One minute, 56. So what is one minute, 56? It's going to be 60 seconds plus 56 seconds being 116 seconds. 
Next down we have one minute and one minute and 20, that would be what? 80 seconds. Then we have one minute and what? One minute, nine seconds. So it would be 69. Oops, 69. Zero minutes in seconds only. So we have 46. And then we have what, 21, right? So make sure all of the units is in seconds and not you're right, not writing one minute, like two seconds like that. All of it in seconds. And then we have to see the temperature of the solution when the text becomes visible. Thermometer shows 20, not, okay. So when you're doing this in the exam, use a ruler. So you see how this is, isn't exactly 21, I think. It should be 20.5 because it's in the middle. If you're doing 20.5, make sure to put all the values into one decimal place. Here, it's definitely 27 since it's lined there. So I would put 27.0 there. Remember, all of them, all temperatures should be shown to one decimal place. Or you'll get like the whole thing wrong, I think. Uh, here, definitely 30.0. Here, definitely 37.0. And then finally, we have what? So this is the middle again. So it'll be 46.5. So make sure to put all of the temperatures into one decimal place. And the time should be just um, just like whole number. Okay? So this is the part which I think most people get well, uh, is tricky because you have to draw the scale correctly and plot the results correctly as well, and also draw the smooth curve of best fit. So we've already done the x-axis first. We'll do the y-axis. For the y-axis, I'm going to do. Let's see what is it has to be. Time taken for the text, so it has to range. Let's see the smallest value is twenty point five, highest is forty six. So I'm going to do twenty to fifty. So we're going to take, let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So this is a do twenty. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, thirty. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, forty. So it has to extend at least halfway. Oh, okay. 30, 35, 40, 45. Okay, I think that's better. So so to do it in fives instead. 20, 25, 30. I think 35 here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 40, and then actually is it 45.6 oh, it's 46.5 okay then we can't do that let's just do this then all right Ten, twenty, thirty, forty, fifty. okay that's more than enough and it's halfway um, up it extends right now we have to basically plot the points. Let's see if we can do this loop, like page view, full page. Oh no, it's not that page. Okay. okay. Okay, so first let's do time. Oh, is that time taken? Oh my god. Okay, let me just do the correct axis. Okay, so here's going to be our axis. I've done it in 20s like this. Make sure I start at zero. Then basically, it's a bit difficult to do for me here, but you would plot the points and it would look something like, let's see, um, take 116 and 20.5. So that would be about, let's see here. I'm, I'm just doing this as an example. This is not correct, but more of a sketch. 80, 27, 27 should be around here. Sorry, that's usually 30, but uh, then 69, 30, 69, 69, 
46.5, over here. And then we're going to draw a smooth curve. So obviously use your pencil and then you would draw something like this. Obviously it's not very perfect since I'm doing it on the laptop, but you should be able to do it nicely. You're going through all your points. So it will look something, not exactly like this, but something like this. Did you see experiment, uh, sorry, this in which the rate of reaction is fastest? So that's obviously going to be your experiment five because it's happening at such like only 21 seconds. So even without the graph, you can just um, answer that experiment five. And here you have to use your graph to predict the temperature of the solution when the text becomes visible after 55 seconds. So my graph will definitely be wrong because I haven't continued it like this. So. Um, but I'm going to use a mark scheme. Here it says you basically have to do your own answer. But even though this might not be correct, you basically join the 55 point to your graph and then check the y axis. So mine is about what, two, four, six, eight, ten. Mine is about 10 degrees. So that would be my answer. But obviously, it would be different for you according if you've drawn your um, graph correctly. So basically have to take it at 55 and then check the temperature that corresponds on the y-axis. Explain why wrapping the beaker in cotton wool after it has been heated will improve the accuracy of the results. This is because what cotton is an insulator, so it reduces heat loss. So it's an insulator, so reduces heat loss. Explain why it would be an improvement to measure the volume of aqueous iron 3 nitrate in a burette rather than measuring cylinder. This question comes all the time. Trust me, like it's probably the easiest question here. It's because the temperature remains constant. Sorry. Uh, what is that for? Oh, right, right. So this is going to be the burette is more accurate. And here it's the fact that the temperature remains constant because you don't want the temperature decreasing as you're like waiting to put something in, right? Because that will provide inaccurate results. So just why it would be not be an improvement to add the aqueous uh, sodium thiosulfate using a pipette. Pipette, it will be very, very, very slow to add. So I'm just gonna write that down, which will obviously lead to inconsistencies in your experiment. So just why the aqueous sodium thiosulfate must be added after the aqueous iron 3 nitrate has been heated, not before it is heated, because otherwise it will literally react while it is being heated. So that's not very good. It will, uh, sorry, will react while being heated. So you have to wait till the aqueous iron 3 nitrate has been heated and not before. Describe how the results of the experiment would change when the experiment is repeated using a 250 centimeter cube, sorry, beaker in place of the 100 centimeter. It will obviously be um, quicker, so the time will be shorter because there's less depth to look through. Less depth to look through. Okay, so this is how you do that. And yes, sorry, I forgot about the temperature constant because you need to be constant um, for the experiment to be very accurate and not inconsistent with its results. Okay, this is probably my favorite part of paper six, um, the testings, because I, I don't know. It's just like all the colors. So I guess that makes me feel a bit more happy. A student has two substances, solution F and solid G. And this is for solution F. Let's see what the observations are here. Do a does a flame test light green color, and to the second pillow, uh, sorry, portion, they added sodium hydroxide and a piece of aluminum foil. That uh, F one succeed, and the gas turned damp red litmus paper blue, and then added dilute nitric acid with equal silver nitrate. So that means there's no halide ions. 
question asks how to do the frame test. So two very important things you have to say, you have to use a wire because that's how you basically get the solid on and into the flame. And then you put the sample into the flame and the flame should be what blue. So put sample into into a blue flame. You can say that you get a uh, full mark. Put sample into the blue flame. Uh, from buns in or in buns and bun. Because it has to be a blue flame. It can't be any like orange one. It has to be very very strong. A roaring flame. You can also say. Identify the gas given off in test two. So if it was effervescence, that obviously means, sorry, uh, it's not effervescence, effervescence. And then the gas turned damp, prettless flavor to blue. So that's obviously ammonia because ammonia is a very alkaline gas. Identify solution F. So you know there's some kind of ammonia in solution F um, because it has um, done here. But if you look at the test again, even though ammonia was produced, it wasn't to identify ammonia. It was the fact that if ammonia was seen, it would have been something else. What is that something else? It's nitrate. So this is the test for nitrates. It's positive for nitrates. And then the flame was also light green color, meaning it was barium 2 plus. So what are the two ions we have here? We have Ba2 plus and NO3 minus. So please remember, even though we got ammonia, that doesn't mean ammonia is actually in the compound. But the fact that ammonia was like to confirm that it was nitrate. Basically that. State what would be observed if the student adds dilute sulfuric acid to another portion of solution F. So solution F is your what? Barium nitrate, right? If you're adding sulfuric acid, it's definitely going to turn into a white precipitate. Because the test for what? Sulfates, you're adding your barium sulfate or barium nitrate. Since we literally know there is sulfuric acid, it's going to turn into a white precipitate of what? Barium chloride, we call it. Sorry, barium sulfate. Test on solid G. Solid G, they've already given us what it is. So it's iron 2 carbonate. Uh, about 10 centimeter cube of dilute sulfuric gas is added to the solid G, sorry, sulfuric acid. Any gas given off is tested. So what definitely happens is there's going to be some kind of fizzing or you can also say effervescence because it's a carbonate. So fizzing and also if, uh, and sorry, the lime water turns milky. So these are the two things you always have to know that the fact that it fizzes and that the lime water turns, turns milky in color, like basically like cloudy. To the product from E, which is iron 2 sulfate, aqueous sodium hydroxide is added. So since it's the iron 2 plus iron, it will definitely be a green precipitate in when we add uh, aqueous sodium hydroxide. And then in excess, it will still be a green precipitate, like nothing happens. It's basically insoluble in excess. Okay. <laughs> So basically for this part, you just really have to know the test results and what they are, especially flame test. And this was something new this time. I think it's not commonly repeated. So that's also useful to know. And finally, we have the big six mark experiment question. So I'll let you guys read this and then I'm actually going to come on with the answer and then we can uh, discuss it together. Okay, so here is the actual mark scheme alongside. Why I wanted to show this is I think the best way to revise six mark question is actually looking at the mark scheme because it clearly shows all the things you need. And often for these experiment questions, they are often repeated. So especially this one, I've seen it many, many times. So it's very useful to know the mark scheme down and apply it to all the other questions which say the same thing. So it says the metal polish is a mixture of four substances. And then we basically have to uh, find the percentage by mass of silicon IV oxide in the mixture. Um, basically, we take that thing, we have to separate it in literally every four thing and also find the percentage by mass of silicon IV oxide. So to find the percentage by mass, we have to like know that you have to have the first overall mass and then just the 
silicon IV oxide mask, right? So first thing obviously to do is just um, wear the polish. So that's why the first thing is wear the polish. So you get one mark for that. Now what you have to do is you have to know the solubility of them. So we have the solubility in water and the reaction with, uh, sorry, dilute nitric acid. So next what we have to do is what? We have to dissolve it with nitric acid because both propanol, ethanoic acid, two things we don't need to know. We're going to get rid of them by adding the nitric acid since it's dissolving there. So that's why we add the nitric acid. Then we have to specifically state where do we add them and combine it in. So always remember to mention your equipment because you can literally just get a separate mark for saying that you're combining the nitric acid and the polish in a suitable container. So that can be like a beaker. Now you want to warm it up. Why? You want to warm it up to get rid of the iron 3 oxide because you know that you only have to have the silicon IV oxide now because you just want the mass of that and to calculate the percentage by mass of um, the silicon IV oxide only. So you want to get rid of literally all three of these. You only want this in the end. So you're going to find ways to just get rid of them. Firstly, by adding nitric acid. You're warming it up now because then you're going to get rid of the iron 3 oxide, which is insoluble. Since it's insoluble, we have to definitely filter it and we have to dry it. That's what is mentioned here. So this will get you your what, fifth mark. Then simply we are going to weigh our silicon IV oxide and you can also state the equation here, which is percentage is mass over this times 100. So really, even though it's six marks, it's really, really, really easy. And that's partly because if you already know, if you've already seen these questions, these are not new questions personally. You've seen these, they just use like different names. Like they've just given you like a substance like polish a mixture and they've uh, separated and then you have to basically get rid of each one until you have silicon IV oxide or whatever you have to find the mass of. And then even by just mentioning the fact that you have to mix it in a beaker get you one, gets, gets you one mark. So this is a really easy question. It's not difficult at all in my opinion because if you practice a lot of past papers, you'll see that they are constantly repeating and the fact that you can get marks for very simple, very simple um, things. So let's move back to the actual paper and then we'll give an overall review. Okay, so as I said, this paper six was relatively easy because again, these things have always come. So one of my main advice is to always practice. For paper six, unlike paper four, like the stuff is repeated like insanely uh, so many amount of times like especially these questions i think i've seen them like a gazillion times before so just really practice 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 and if you have any questions please put them down in the comments so our team can reach out to you and thank you very much for watching bye